Greetings, folks, and welcome to Mac Geek Gab. Our quick tip of the week comes from me. I was having all kinds of slowness in email and in mail on my Mac in the office, but nowhere else. And then I realized, wait, it's not everywhere in mail. It's only my inbox. Every time I would file something, it would take like five seconds for it to reply or respond or, you know, like refresh the interface. And so I thought I have it. I know what to do. And it worked. I went to the mailbox menu while my inbox was selected and chose rebuild. This sort of wipes out the local cache, redownloads everything from the IMAP server, and it made it so much better. So remember this mailbox rebuild that you select the mailbox first, the one you want to rebuild the mailbox rebuild. It redownloads it from the IMAP server. More quick tips like this, plus your questions answered today on Mac Geek 988 for Monday, June 26th, 2023. And indeed, greetings, folks. Welcome to the show. This is here at Mac Geek Gab. We take your quick tips like you just heard or my quick tips. Sometimes our quick <laughs> tips. Uh, we take your cool stuff found that you send in. We take your questions that you send in. We answer the questions. We share the quick tips and cool stuff found. The goal is we put it all together into an agenda so that every single one of us learns at least five new things. Every single time we get together. Beat me. I, I tried, Pete. You know, sponsors for this episode include Notion.com slash Mac Geek Gab, where you can go and try Notion projects for free. HelloFresh.com slash MGG16, where code MGG16 gets you 16 free meals and free shipping. And Collide at K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash MGG. Zero trust security tailor made for Octa. We'll talk more in depth about how each of those works and why you're going to want to visit them and see if they work for you in a minute. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here on the other side of the planet from Hong Kong, Nihau, it's Pilot Pete. Hey, Pilot Pete. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing well. And the comment about you beat me, we talk about timing and strange coincidence. Quinky dinkies. My son texted me just as you were talking about learning five new things. Yep. And so I got the tone in my ear, the ding, and I thought, oh, you hit the bell as you oh. talked about learning five new things. I was wondering what I beat you to. <laughs> <laughs> you were beat. I was just about to press the bell button. Yeah. Down, and instead, I got the ding in my ear that my son had texted That's me, but I didn't. Awesome. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> misunderstandings in life. Uh, yes. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes yes. they're tragic. You need a podcasting <laughs> focus mode, Pete. So. Yeah, I have one. Maybe yeah. I should turn it on and use it. That might not be a bad idea. <laughs> I um, I have you know, my life is all about litmus tests, and and here we are in our first tangent here. I, the um, the candle being lit here in my studio, and and today the candle is uh, Pink Sands from Yankee Candle. Uh, but the candle being lit reminds me or tells me that I went through my pre flight checklist because it's on the list, and I don't light the candle until I get to that point in the list. So I know I've gone through our pre-flight checklist for the show. Chances are everything's going to be okay. Uh, my favorite litmus test like that uh, story is, of course, about the band Van Halen. You've probably heard that they used, they, they were uh, in their dressing room. Uh, brown M&Ms were to be removed from the candy bowls in, uh, that was uh, written out in their writer. That was not just because they were prima donnas. It was probably in part because they were prima donnas. But the uh, the the real reason was they were doing a fairly complex stage show, which could be dangerous if things weren't built to spec. And the specs were also in that rider. And so they knew if the brown M&Ms had been removed, somebody read the rider and paid attention to the specs and the stage was going to be okay. If the brown M&Ms were in the candy bowl, they knew they had to go and check everything when they got there. So the candle's lit. Everything's good, folks. And we can go to uh, Mark's quick tip, which is, uh, he says, restaurants are still using QR codes for men menus. Often, it's a pain chasing the little yellow box under the QR code in the iPhone's camera. There's a trick to make the scan happen in one step. First, you open settings on your iPhone. You scroll down to command center. 
scroll down to code scanner and use the green plus to add it to your iPhone's control center. Now, no matter what you're doing, you can swipe down from the top right to pull up the command center on your phone and then tap the QR code box in an icon, which opens up the code scanner, the code reader, uh, and it jumps to whatever it reads. There's no chasing it around because it's not just happening inside the camera. It is literally happening in a bespoke code scanner app that is on your iPhone. There are multiple ways of pulling this up. Mark is correct that uh, adding it to, you know, uh, control center. I think he, I said command center when I was reading, but I meant control center. My apologies. So you can add it to control center and then it's there when you swipe down from the, the, the upper right. You can also simply search for code scanner in spotlight on your phone. And that also does it. Yep. It shows right up little code mm -hmm. scanner. And then, uh, Somebody in our, our Discord shared, I think it might have even been Mark, shared, he did. Mark shared a, uh, a shortcut to do this as well. And so uh, I've put a link to the shortcut here in the show notes for you at MacGeekGab.com uh, or MGG.FM slash 988. Because you can always get to any episode you want, including, if you must, episode one. But that's on you if you choose to listen to episode <laughs> one. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's entertainment value alone dave well it's something there's value sure <laughs> sure yeah sure all right uh well, you want to take wouldn't be this good now if it wasn't you know that's growing pains and steps absolutely well, yeah no you gotta yeah. start somewhere yeah. and it, and yeah. i that that is good advice like with anything in life you if you wait until you're ready you will never start so. bingo exactly right yeah so. all right pete speaking of you want to share tig's quick tip I, I do. Um, I just am angry that I didn't think of it myself because I have two separate folders to do what he does in one. Whenever I buy a new item, Tig writes, I get a PDF of the manual, parse if available, and then save them to my books app. There I open the manual and combine it with the parts and also attach a PDF of my receipt at the end from where I bought them, but where I bought the item. That way I have access to all my manuals, devices, and receipts if we ever need warranty repair. Oh, like I say, I I had a I have a manuals folder and I have a receipts folder, but good luck finding what a brilliant idea to put them in books and put the receipt with the manual for the item you bought. Yeah, I I Just, I, I love this idea, by the way. I, of course it's I great. now I'm analyzing it. Why books and not notes? It seems like notes might be a uh, another, I don't know if it's better or worse. That's what I'm trying to sort of sort out. As I'm going to, I'm going to conject <laughs> that, conject. that it was, conject yes. away. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to conject that he did this before notes was off its backside in, in quality. Yeah. Um, it, that's you know, fair. Obviously it's gotten improved recently. So yes, yes, yeah. yes. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I, cause I would do, I like, I have like you, uh, a, user manuals folder that I, I store, but I, ne I've never yeah. stored the receipt. Like what? That's brilliant. Yeah. 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 And when I lose the user manual, I hope that you two have somebody fiddling with what I need to do to restring the weed whacker. It, it is so much easier <laughs> to store the user manual for a product the day that you bought it. Cause you can go to the manufacturer, yes. you download their PDF, but they go away over time. Yeah. They, sh they yeah. shouldn't, but they do with, with a lot of manufacturers, not everybody. But yeah, storing those user manuals somewhere has saved my butt so many times. And and I will tell you why I created a user manuals folder to store things in. It was because I needed a user manual that I could not find, like not easily find. I probably spent an hour scouring the internet for someone who had the PDF that wasn't behind some, you know, BS paywall or whatever. And uh, finally I got it and it was like, all right, I'm not doing this again. I'm putting it in the folder. And I was like, wait a minute. I, ding ding ding! I have an idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can put them all in there. I can put them all in there. Yeah. We're exactly. putting it in books and then putting the receipt with it. Brilliant. I like it. Well, well played, sir. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right, listener Jim brings us to our next quick tip. He shares. Uh, he says, "Maybe everyone knows this. No, not everybody. That's that's why we do what we do. That's the beauty of a quick tip. If you think everybody knows this, that's that's what makes it a quick tip." Right. 
Uh, he says, but I navigated away uh, from a Microsoft Teams meeting and the shared screen that was being shared in the Teams meeting moved into picture and picture mode, taking up the full width of half of my screen. So half the width of my screen and covering the thing that I needed to see when I was out of the meeting. He says, I know you can fling it around the screen and move it from corner to corner. He says, but instead I used my trackpad and pinched it. And the picture in picture screen shrunk to a postage stamp size in one corner. I already knew you can swipe it to the edge of a screen to put it in a drawer with an arrow handle. Uh, but I wanted to share this. Yeah. And the other thing is, and I don't have anything in picture in picture on my Mac. So like, I'm going to misremember this because I do it differently each time. It's either the command key, the option key. When you have picture in picture on the Mac, you can fling it to any corner you want. You can also with either the command or the option key down, move it to exactly where you want. So it doesn't have to be a corner. It can just be, you know, anywhere on the edge. And it, and you gotta, you gotta hold down the option key or the command key when you're doing it. I, I want to say command. And I like, to me, command is, I am telling you something. Listen to me, computer. And, and Apple has mostly followed that paradigm. So I think it is command, but it, I might be wrong on that. So just FYI. So, so, there you go. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jim. Yeah. I, I really wish StreamYard would put um, our video picture in picture because I would like to have our video floating on the screen while I do the show, Pete. I might, That'd be nice. I might send this as a... Uh, yeah. Are you listening, StreamYard? As a, yeah, <laughs> as, a, as a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, PC Unix in our Discord has a, uh, a, a, a tip, quick tip for us. That's why we're here. Uh, it says, I long pressed on a photo in one of the Medium articles I was reading and up popped the option to show the text in the photo. That's pretty cool, he says, although the long press is a little funky and erratic. Knowing that you can do this helps. Uh, so, yeah, he's right. If you've got a it, it, this, you know, kind of works universally across uh iOS on the iPhone and iPad OS on the iPad is, is yeah. You just long press on the picture and boom up comes the little thing where you can share, save to photos, copy or show the text. And then it will just show you the yeah. text. So yeah. And for, for that. people that don't remember photos now will find texts, text within your photos. Yeah. That happened to me this week. Um, you may remember Dave, I sent you a picture of an airplane shadowed on a cloud and around that shadow was the rainbow, the complete, but not just the bow, the entire circle around it. That's yeah. the that's the phenomenon. And the phenomenon is called a glory. And I was searching through my photos and I searched for the word glory. And I instead of doing because I thought, well, I would have tagged it with that, but right. I forgot it was only tagged with aviation. But it found a headstone from Disney World haunted mansion, you know, here, here, oh. ri here lies Walt Bender who rode to glory on a fender. What? <laughs> yes. It found that photo <laughs> by the word searching for glory in photos. So you can find all kinds, all manner of things. Uh, if you know that there's something written in, on a sign in the photo you're looking for. That's amazing. For oh, that's, I love it that. Really I mean, I, I've seen it happen, but it, like they're the finding yeah. it that way. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. And now I've mentioned it. I may be worth sharing that photo in, in show notes. Oh yeah. I don't know if you can do that or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? Put it in the, uh, we've created a, a separate oh, let me, discord, yeah. uh, yeah. on, in our discord group, which you can get to it. Mac slash discord. All are welcome. It is a fantastic place to be. Uh, we've created in the live chat, we've, we've created a, a thread for each episode so that if you want to come back and see what was being discussed, by everyone who was here live when we were recording, you can see that. So Pete uh, can pop that in there for sure. Yeah. I'll share the next tip while Pete's doing that. Porthos John shares for us a fantastic piece of advice, which is install manually install Rosetta two on every Mac you set up. He says, I found this out because our deploy solution at work auto installs some printer drivers. As soon as a new machine is deployed by default, Apple will always require user intervention to install Rosetta 2, and many times it won't go back to the original install. So the quick tip is, when you get a new Apple Silicon machine, install Rosetta 2 before anything else. You can't do it from the GUI. 
but there's a quick terminal command and it, it uses the software update terminal command. It's in the show notes at mgg.fm slash 988. I'm not going to read it here. Uh, and, uh, and then it, you know, then you've got it. I've run into this when I've used migration assistant to migrate to, uh, you know, it, an Apple Silicon machine. It could be from an, another Apple Silicon machine, or it could be from, uh, you know, an Intel machine or whatever, but invariably there's going to be an app out there that needs Rosetta two. And it's best if you just have it installed because you won't know I've, I've done migration assistant and you know, launch, you know, reboot the machine and it's like ready to go. It's like, how come three things aren't running? What's going on? And then I realize, oh, I need to install Rosetta two. So Rosetta's for <clears throat> Rosetta stone for translating languages. Right. This, right. This is, so this is a translator for lack of a better understanding. Yeah. It's, it's, it lets you run Intel apps on Apple Silicon. It is the magic that, that sits there. Rosetta let you run oh, power PC apps on Intel. Rosetta two okay. lets you run Intel apps on Apple Silicon. So Apple, you got to quit switching. I don't know. It seems to work out switch. for us. Because Although I, I, I do. Yeah, I do yeah, like I, these I'm chips not, I don't want them so to much better than Intel. Yeah. yeah. If <laughs> these the next are amazing machines, if the next chip switch, whenever Apple chooses to do that is as helpful and remarkable as the switch to Apple Silicon, I want it to happen. Yeah. 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 Right. The so. next one is quantum computing from Apple. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 So, yeah, it's uh, so this is a great tip. I, I love this just to make sure you've got it. And then, you know, all is is uh, good to go. I wonder how many apps I threw away when I switched over to the M1. It just never occurred to me to go and look for Rosetta. To, well, it, it you should. Know, your, your app developer needs to update this. Well, that's the thing, right? And if they don't update it for the M1. Yeah, but they don't have to with Rosetta 2. That's the beauty is it right, just That's my point. And it, it never occurred runs. to me to put it on Rosetta. I said, I wonder how many apps I got rid of and just, well, oh, it doesn't work anymore. I in, don't know. In theory, the, the first time you launch an app that needs it, the system will ask you if you want to install it. The problem oh. comes from okay. the, the like migration installs. Sometimes yeah. you miss that step. It happens, but you don't see it. Or like okay. Porthos John described, You've got some scripted installation. Again, you're not there. You don't see it. You don't, you can't agree. And so it doesn't happen. Yeah. And then it doesn't ask you again. That's, that's where the problem is. But yeah, if you were to oh, set up yeah. from scratch and do it all from the GUI and pay attention to everything, there would be that moment where you went to run something and it would be like, Hey, I need Rosetta two for this. Are you okay with it? And you say yes. And then, you know, and then you're good to go. So, um, so yeah, it, it, for most of us, it, it is built to happen with user intervention, with user approval, but automatically. It just doesn't always work that way. So, right. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. We got some, uh, I think Tim's might be a follow-up tip or or certainly a, um, th th I thought we covered it, but maybe, maybe we haven't. Uh, Tim's tip is, he says, one of my Apple TVs is connected to a soundbar. I have the remote set up to adjust the volume via infrared in the remotes and devices settings. One day I found I couldn't adjust the volume. So naturally I thought I needed to reset it in the remotes and devices settings. I did that. No luck. Then I took the drastic step of resetting the Apple TV. No luck again. I don't know how I stumbled onto the eventual solution, but did you know that you can restart the Apple TV remote for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it says, uh, and, and there's an Apple support article that describes how to do it. I thought I had put the, the, it thought I'd put it in the notes, but I will, I will read it to us all here. Yeah. So to restart your remote, you hold down the TV control center button and the volume down button at the same time. So you would have a hard time accidentally doing this. This requires two hands. So you hold down the T the button with the picture of the TV that brings you to control center and uh, the volume down button for about five seconds or until the status light on your Apple TV turns off and on again. Then you release the buttons, wait another five to 10 seconds for a connection loss notification to appear on your TV screen, wait while your remote restarts. And when the connected notification reappears or appears on your screen, then your remote has restarted and you're good to go. I don't know when the last time was I restarted my Apple TV remote, but uh, it's been a long time. And hopefully yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting that these things have their own operating systems, and sometimes they just need to be yeah. restarted. So and thank the you. Batteries for that, in those too. last a long time. Did I see you a thread that. somewhere about yeah. Qi charging on the bit on? The new remotes? No, you saw, I don't think they have Qi charging in them. Uh, no, you saw a thread that Apple has finally confirmed that they have, uh, they are find my capable and have always been find my capable, but we don't get to use that functionality until iOS 17 comes out. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like what the heck? Why, why? I mean, why is that the holdback? Like, what the heck? The good news is that will free up an AirTag that I have in a special case for for my Apple TV remote with the AirTag attached to it. So, as as maybe maybe we need to be careful here. There was a moment in my uh, the 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 period of time where Lisa and I were raising our kids. I mean, I I don't know if that's ended, but earlier in that period, anyway, uh, it's changed. That's all. That certainly happened. There you go. But um. Where like the kids noticed that we were watching like the second season of some TV show that Lisa and I had been watching it ourselves after they went to bed. We, we had watched the first season together as a family. And my daughter, she was like, what you're watching that shows back and you guys are watching it without us. And I was like, yep. And she said, what else are you hiding from us? And so <laughs> the thing was, my answer to that question was, I will tell you everything I get to pick the order and I'm going to start with your conception. Do you want me to continue? And her answer was no, because she's smart. Uh, we raised, we raised a smart, a smart human. Um, yes. Apple's been hiding the find my functionality in the Apple TV remote from us. I don't know that we want to ask Apple. What else have you been hiding from us? <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> I don't know. Very good point. I don't oh, know. Maybe man. we do. Some... Yeah. 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 But like, well. the, 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 I think Apple hides some stuff from us that we don't want to know. They certainly hide stuff from us that they don't want us to know. But they also, Absolutely. they also hide stuff from us that, that maybe we don't want to know. Maybe. And maybe. later in the show, we got more about other big tech hiding. Yeah. Stuff that's fair. Us, so yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, in 986, I opened up the show with the the quick tip about dragging the iPhone camera shutter button and and doing uh, quick videos and that sort of thing from the camera, which is great. And if you haven't done that yet, I highly recommend it. It's it's awesome. Makes life super easy. Um, it, it's it, just quickly for people that haven't heard please. it. You drag the camera shutter button up to the to, to the, the right the two arrows that say you know switch from front camera to back camera. Yes, you drag it to the right. You you and you that hold, automatically starts video. Yep, hold down the shutter and dra- just drag it to the right. That starts okay. video. Correct. Sorry for the interrupt. Nope, that's right. And if you drag it to the left, it does burst mode. So there you go. Yes, um, which was Adrian's tip, and so I jumped the gun on that one. But I have another tip for us too. Um, Corey reminds us that if you drag the camera shutter button, uh, you will get lower quality videos than you get with going to the video portion of the camera and selecting it. Uh, He said, so it's a great tip, but it's worth knowing that this is probably not the way you want to record videos in general uh, because you're, you're, you're not going to get like full, you know, 4k if you have it set for that or or whatever. So I wish I'd gone back and looked, I didn't look and see what resolution and frame rate it gives, but yeah, it's not giving you 4096 at 60 frames a second. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's able to happen so quickly. Right. You know, you notice when you switch from camera to video mode, there's a, there's a breath that your phone takes. There's some thinking going on. Exactly. Where it it (laughs) rejiggers the cameras and all that stuff. So yeah. So thank you for that, Corey. And uh, again, thank you, Adrian, for the tip uh, about dragging to the left for burst mode, because that is also uh, important. There is one last tip on this, though, and that comes from listener Paul, who kind of blew my mind with this one. And uh, I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm going to pull it up here. But uh, yeah, he says, uh, adding to the quick tip while holding the button to record, um, I'm not always stable. And one time I swiped up and down and found that it affected the zoom of the video. 
So he says, I tried combining. Uh, he says the only other way I've found to to affect the zoom was to pinch the video once it had started, which you can also do. He says, so I tried combining the two. Once the video had started, I swiped a video momentarily, momentarily pressed to start. Okay, great. So like in normal video mode, uh, I pressed and held the record button and was able to swipe up and down to one handed zoom in and out while recording a video. Very cool, Paul. I had no idea that you could do one handed zoom, uh, but but evidently I didn't either. I wonder can, if it actually switches to that telephoto lens itself. It, well, well, the way, yeah, it, it, I think the answer is if necessary, the, the yeah. phone is, is as I understand it, I didn't write this stuff folks. Uh, as I understand it though, it's, it's sort of capturing from all sources all the time and compositing the best version of what you are trying to record. And so, as you zoom, it it adjusts the blend of those things, and that's how uh, that's how okay. that yeah that's how that works. All right, hey, you folks know me. I love getting things done. I love being productive. I love managing projects. I love seeing the progress of things, and of course, the results. It's awesome, but it drives me crazy when I have to be inefficient and jump from tool to tool just to see what everything is doing and how everything is going. If you're like me and this sounds like you, then listen up. Our sponsor Notion is an incredible tool that makes it so much easier to make progress on your projects. Project management tools are supposed to help you move faster and stay organized. But if you're jumping between 50 tabs just to do your job, then maybe you haven't found the right tool yet. And again, that's where Notion comes in. And today I'm excited to share that they've just launched Notion Projects, which includes new powerful ways to manage projects and leverage the power of their built-in AI features too. I know it's so cool. Notion Projects combines project management with your docs, your knowledge base, and AI, so you can stop jumping between tools and stop paying too much for them too. You get to do this all in one workspace, from brainstorming to drafting your launch plans to organizing sprints and keeping everyone on deadline. On top of that, Notion AI helps you automate all that tedious overhead, like summarizing meeting notes or finding next steps. Do your most efficient work with Notion Projects. You can try it for free today at Notion.com slash MacGeekGab. That's all lowercase letters, Notion.com slash MacGeekGab. When you use our link, you're supporting the show, which we love. Go right now to Notion.com slash MacGeekGab and our thanks to Notion Projects for sponsoring this episode. And hey, this summer, our sponsor, HelloFresh, is here to take the work out of eating well. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You get to skip those trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. You get farm-to-table quality with every HelloFresh box. HelloFresh's seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness and travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days for fresh flavor in every bite. Sometimes Lisa and I find that we're stuck in a recipe rut. You know, we're making the same thing over and over again. It's good, but you want to change it up, right? With HelloFresh, you can take a bite out of something new with 40 recipes to choose from weekly. With options to please even the pickiest eaters, you'll always find meals everyone at the table will enjoy. We've been loving this and we're going to keep doing it. You can do it too. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MGG16 and then use code MGG16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash MGG16 and use code MGG16 for those 16 free meals plus free shipping. And our thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. Next up is our sponsor, Collide, with some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How do they perform this magic? Well, if a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication, and it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. Then it's really cool. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, 
It alerts the user. And then this is the part I love. It gives them instructions to fix it themselves. So they're teaching the user right there in the moment what's wrong, what they need to do to fix it. It gets buy-in from everyone. Of course, if they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash MGG to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash MGG. And our thanks to Collide for sponsoring this episode. All right, Pete, let's do some, uh, let's do some questions here. We will go. We can do that. We can. We will go to listener Jim, uh, I think, if it wants to come up here. He has a question about his yeah. Wi-Fi. He says, um, what is, he says, I, I am facing the daunting task of upgrading my several-year-old Netgear Orbi mesh router satellite. And I have two questions. What's the best choice of mesh system these days? I have a three-floor brick home and penetrating the brick exterior walls to power security cameras and video doorbells is not simple. I'm currently operating a two-station system with Orbi, but I really think that for the size and layout of the house, a three-station system is a better option. I'm not a power user, but I do want a system with easy-to-implement basic security measures. Okay? Well, no. Jim, you're going to have to move. That's right. <laughs> Next question. That's right. Next question. Yeah, what's the question? <laughs> That's right. I assume you've called a realtor. Uh, <laughs> number two, what's the easiest way to migrate to the new Wi-Fi system? I have dozens of devices connected, including computers, phones, iPads, Apple TVs, Roku's, light bulbs, switches, and who knows what else. I'm assuming the devices have to be added to the new network individually, which will be a lot of work. So any hints on how to make that even a little bit easier and get done faster would be greatly appreciated. I'm not sure if this matters or not, and I appreciate you adding this in, Jim, uh, but I am using Verizon Fios as my ISP, but I only use their router to get the signal into the house. I have the Wi-Fi disabled on it, and I don't use it to assign IPs or manage the network. Okay, so this is that that is an important piece of information. Uh, so I am glad that you uh, threw it in. Starting at the top, my still favorite mesh is Eero. Um, you know, they've been in the game the longest in terms of compu consumer focused mesh and, and wireless mesh. Yes, there are other vendors who have been doing like wired mesh longer, but, uh, but, but Eero, you know, they, they really are the ones that figured out the way to do this for consumers and they're clearly committed to staying current. And they also have the benefit of working the best in all of my tests. Plume is up there with them. Um, Plume's marketing has changed a little bit and is more focused on, um, you know, like their partnerships with uh, like, like I, ISPs like Comcast and stuff. There's nothing wrong with the hardware. It's just, they, they've changed their marketing a little bit. I think they're, they're sort of going B2B and, and letting their partners do the B2C part. But I think you can still get Plume stuff and, I would I would recommend that too. I like the fact that Eero and Plume are cloud managed. If that's something that you are not comfortable with, then I, I want you to know that. I, the reason I like the cloud management is because of all the machine learning that gets to happen. They know what works and doesn't work with every type of device. You know, they know that you know the Galaxy Ten or whatever needs to be treated this way whereas the iphone 14 needs to be treated that way for handoffs and all of that stuff and having that knowledge constantly sort of pushed to my devices is fantastic they thus far neither company has had any privacy concerns or issues doesn't mean that they can't uh but i know that the way they've sort of architected things it might be nearly impossible for that to happen. So, uh, so I feel comfortable with it, but again, I just wanted to share that, but there is a benefit to the cloud management. My, uh, close second or third to those two, depending on how you want to look at it is TP links deco line. They are the budget friendly choice, uh, but it, you, you are not giving up much for saving some money there. It's like, the, there's a net win here. Uh, it is not cloud managed, which is probably the reason that it's not at the top of my list. But the TP-Link Deco line is fantastic. And then from any of those, pick the right amount of units. So, Jim, for your in your case, it sounds like three is is what you want to go with. And that's that makes sense to me with what you're describing. 
and then also your preferred, you know, Wi-Fi type. I wouldn't get anything less than Wi-Fi six these days. I'd probably lean towards six E if you really want to bleeding edge yourself, Wi-Fi seven, fine. Um, and you know, and go from there. You, you can always add more units after the fact you can't change the Wi-Fi type on the existing units you have, but like with Eero, you could have Wi-Fi six units and then add a Wi-Fi six E unit and things connected to that would use six E obviously the other ones don't update to six E, but, uh, but yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's lots out there. And in fact, I believe, uh, it's Brian Monroe in our live chat. Just put a link to the TP link, uh, B E 33,000, which is, or the deco B E 95, which is their Wi-Fi seven mesh system. So, but, uh, but yeah, if you, if you want Wi-Fi seven, that's it. So yeah, we'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes, of course. Um, but uh, in terms now, before you get to go, the second part, yeah, go ahead. I want to alert everybody: if you've slightly tuned out, tune back in. This answer is brilliant. Okay, seriously, it's a great <laughs> answer, and I wish it had never occurred to me when I was dealing with switching over my Wi-Fi recently. Remember, I had the the it, the name kept logging me off my own Wi-Fi. I'd come mm. home and I and I wound up having to change it. And if I'd have done this, I think I would have solved some problems about getting all my Internet of Things off and back on the network and yeah. in and working. So, so pay attention, folks. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> I, I appreciate that uh, because I think this is the this is the 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 key advice here. As Jim points out, as Pete points out, migrating every device over to your new Wi-Fi network is a pain in the neck, and you will forget something. And the thing that even if you don't forget, like there'll be some devices that are super difficult to do this. You'll have to download an app that you don't have on your current phone, all of that stuff. It's an afternoon of headaches in a, on a good week. Right. So the, my, my, my answer is don't use the same SSI, set the new system up, whatever you get, set it up with the same SSID and password that you currently use. And uh, then you just, you know, once you get the new system up, you'll have them both running next to each other. That's fine. It's okay. Your devices will pick one. It doesn't really matter. And then you'll turn off the old system and then your devices will just pick the new one. There might still be a few IOT devices that get confused by this. The, the, the dumb ones that aren't looking at the name, but are looking at the Mac address of the hardware. Those you will have to reset up. There's really no getting around that. But the vast majority of your devices will just work. This is what I do whenever I um, am testing a new mesh system here, too. I'll set up the new mesh system alongside the existing one and give it a different name and just test it with my phone. So I'm not like, you know, changing the reliance of my network to the new thing. Test it, move around like, yeah, OK, that's cool. I might add my my personal laptop to it. Yep. OK. Seems to be working. Then I change it to the same name that we use for everything else and all the devices start to join. And then I change the other one. If I don't want to just turn it off, I change it to a different name so that it's, you know, like the old network or something and it works out great. Uh, it's the way to do it. So that's my advice. My sort of second piece of advice, which is probably too late for every single one of us listening, but I'll share it anyway, is choose your Wi-Fi network name and password carefully because now you know that you're going to live with it for the rest of your natural life, right? So, you know, <laughs> right. having a Wi-Fi network name is like, you know, that's like, you know, uh, whatever, Orby123456, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, the random names that you get from, from Netgear or whatever, you might want to change it to something that is about you. And I will also say, don't necessarily make it, tied to your address right because if you move houses like jim's gonna have to do obviously because you know his yeah. wi-fi doesn't work that's what pete said uh you want your network to make sense at your new house too so you know but keeping the name the same is is the key in me i'll, so. I'll offer a hint for what i do my, my network name is sharpie because there was a sharpie pen laying on the table when <laughs> i was 
when I was doing it, right? I, and, I had no idea. I, I knew about your Sharpie network. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah, that's why. how I got it. You know, so I'm laying awesome. around I'm frequently uh, when I'm looking for answers to, I use non secretors for my, those security questions and answers. You know, what was your first grade teacher's name? Yeah. You know, Panasonic 35. Well, I had a Panasonic TV in front of me. And so, you know, yeah. put the number, because it all goes into one password. So no one can guess. Yes. What my mother's maiden name was, because right. I guarantee it's not my mother's maiden name. I can tell you that much. It's something else. It's something else. Yeah. And, you can't yeah, guess it either. Other, you got to store it in one. No, password. I have to have one password. There's yeah. no doubt about it, but that's yeah. the beauty of it. And then the other thing I would consider, not, nothing wrong with it, generally speaking, but maybe not make it personally identifiable. Oh, you yeah. yeah. Dave, Dave's or Hamilton's right. network, you know, right. something like that. Maybe some inanimate object or something along those lines. Just just a thought. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it I, makes it I, harder for people in a congested area to know who you are to attack you. That's fair. Yeah, I named my network Dave the Nerd um, years ago because I had to think of something. It was like, well, that's it's you know, it's not tied to an address. It's tied to me, and so it'll be yeah. everywhere I go. I, but you're right that that makes it personally identifiable. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were also not in a super congested area either. Correct. You know, like an my, apartment building. Or, yeah. You know, but I have yeah. gotten texts from like my neighbors. In fact, I have, I got a, a message last year or something from a neighbor that's probably a good 500 feet away from us, maybe a little uh -huh. more. And he's like, yeah, you know, I occasionally see your network show up and he knows it's mine because it shows yeah. up as Dave the Nerd. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but it was like, wow, am I really broadcasting that far? It shouldn't like, right. I don't, uh, I didn't think I was, but who knows? So yeah. Yeah. Yep. So hopefully, hopefully there's some advice in there that's helpful for most of us. So, you want to uh, take us to Terry's safari issues here, Pete? I will do so at this time. Thanks. Terry wrote in and said, look, I tried Google and to find a fix, but I'm stuck. Safari will log me out of my website after I quit Safari. And when I open a new tab and go to a, go to that website, I tried turning off prevent cross-site tracking in Safari settings, but that doesn't seem to work. Also, some suggest someone suggested turning off the develop menu in Safari, which also didn't work. Most suggestions about this problem are from several years ago, and it seems to have been happening for quite some time. First First time for me, though, and it started happening a few days ago. Very e irritating. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Um, I, I sent some basic troubleshooting tips and then and then got the response uh, back from Terry. He said, thanks for the quick response. Problem solved. So I did a great job. Let's move on, Dave. Amazing. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Well, no. Okay. Achievement uh, unlocked. All right. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Problem solved. But with all things computer related, uh, it is still something of a mystery. I did what you asked, reset all defaults, and then turned off the develop menu, quit Safari, and restarted the Mac, and the problem still existed. Okay. So I didn't solve it. Shh. Don't tell anyone. Right. I, I decided to uninstall and reinstall Safari. Tried using the app cleaner, didn't have the permissions on Safari to do so. And then I dragged Safari to the trash and it didn't seem to go into the trash, but it immediately relaunched with all the logins and all websites working. <laughs> Some I had to re-sign in and others were already signed in. Yeah. So either trashing Safari or first doing the develop menu thing and then trashing Safari is the solution, at least for me. Again, thanks for the timely response. And what it boils down to, uh, Dave's response after reading that was bizarre. I seconded that response. Uh, clearly, he trashed some corrupted or misconfigured file in there. And so I have some ideas, though. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So it what it sounds like the what he described is that he is in or his safari was in private browsing mode. Like that is what will happen. You can log into things, but it, when, when you quit or close the browser window, like, or even the tab, it, that's it, right? You're done. Like For privacy reasons, you've asked it to do exactly you that. You asked it to do that. And therefore it did it. I'm going to assume, but I could be wrong that he was not in, you know, perma private, private browsing mode, but some people are like, I've watched my wife on her iPhone, uh, for months, I think she was in private browsing mode, you know, because you get you switch to that mode and then on on your Mac, you might quit Safari sometimes on your phone. You never do. And so it just yeah. stays in whatever mode you're in. She's like, oh, this sucks. I just have to log in again. I'm like, wait, like it. And I could tell because I'm used to the way Safari looks on my phone. I'm like, you're in private browsing mode. Like I could see the color difference or you know whatever yeah. it was, whatever visual indicator. 
And she's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And she had like 40 tabs open in private browsing, right? Because that's where they was opening tabs. Oh. Right. So it's possible he was stuck in private browsing mode and that was this. But let's presume, at least for the sake of our discussion here and for troubleshooting, that he was not. What is private browsing mode? Private browsing is effectively a sandbox thing where it doesn't remember your cookies or your history, right? Um, but let's focus on the cookies because the cookies are the, yeah. the crux of this here. Well, if we go into Safari settings, privacy, there is a checkbox where we can say block all cookies. It's possible that was checked here and was keeping Safari. Well, Safari was doing exactly what it was told. Do not save any cookies, which means when you come back, you know, it'll it'll start a session. It's a cookie, but it's not that kind of cookie. It'll start a session identifier where the browser and the, the website sort of say, yep, we know even though there's new pages being loaded, this is all the same session. You're logged in. You're good. Uh, but that session cookie goes away when you close a window, like even in a, a normal browsing window, even with everything yeah. set right, session cookies go away. So as browser, in order for you to stay logged in, has to store a real cookie a persistent cookie. And, and of course, if you've got that box checked, it cannot. So I, I think it was that or something like that. Interesting. I would, I didn't wander down that path. Cause I assumed that when you block all cookies, you really break stuff. No, it would as break far this. As how the website works. It breaks this. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. But I would think other things wouldn't work either. But, but now, yeah, no, I see how you get a, a different, a session cookie. A session cookie. So, yeah. Know, the session cookies away. still yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah Cause you can yeah. go into private browsing mode and log into Amazon or like I use it constantly because I don't have profiles yet in, in uh, Safari. Safari. We talked about that, right? That's coming in, in the fall. But uh, yeah, I'll use it all the time if it's like I need to go into like our Amazon affiliate account, which is different from my regular Amazon account. And I don't want to log in or if I have to log into a Google account that I can't add to my list that's already logged in. It's just like, well, fire up private browsing. I have one password. Like it's not that big of a deal to log in. And so I log in and I'm good to go. The other thing, and I have, I don't experience this with the consistency that some of you do, but we've had this conversation if you have the develop menu open and you go to the, um, I want to see what the web inspector, uh, which is done with command option. I, uh, to see the way the page is built sometimes. And for some people, all the times are sometimes it will wipe out your login cookies for many, if not all of your websites. I have not experienced this with the degree that some people have, but, but some people are like, oh yeah, every time I open the web inspector, I know that it's going to blow away my login cookies, my persistent cookies for that site. And I'm going to have to log in again the next time I relaunch Safari. So bear, bear in mind that even with Safari. So you're saying I shouldn't have done that on well, the show notes page. <laughs> um, I don't know, Pete, you're about to find, we'll find out. out. Yeah, man. Yep. I, I love that. This is what this I like I I I hope <laughs> I think you will. I hope you take this the right way, but this is one of the things I love about you is you yeah. you will shoot first and ask questions later with with tech stuff on your computer. And sometimes it it really burns you and and sometimes yeah. it burns both of us simultaneously. This uh, is true. But but I'm like, not afraid to break stuff. You're not afraid you know, to break stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I love it. It's great. Yeah. And and yeah. I always learn things, you know, I'll mention something offhandedly folks, right? Like, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, there's the Safari web inspector and I won't add in, but you know, you obviously you would only use that if you knew uh, the implications thereof and how it might work and break things. I mean, the Safari web inspector doesn't really break things, but it's next a, it's time a, you might want to say before you before open, before you, right. <laughs> and, and then three days later, Pete will text me or call me and be like, Dave, I don't know what I did. But none of this stuff works. And I have to go back through my memory. Like, what did I share with Pete that might have been out of context uh, taken down this path? It's like, oh, hey, did you open Web Inspector? It's like, yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Now, but then, like, stuff comes into the show for that. So it's great. Yeah, we know. That's yeah. How, yeah, it's good, man. I, 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 I mean, the whole reason we started including you in the show was because of this, right? Like, you... Yeah. You're curious about the stuff. You want to learn. You ask questions. You know, before we had the live yeah. chat, 
you were the real time representative of a listener. Guy. You were the guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know a gay, and you now know, I am the guy. <laughs> and Pete's the guy. No, it's. It, it, yeah. I think it makes the show a lot better. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, we have uh, Gopher Tech in our uh, 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 Discord, which I've mentioned a yeah. few times. It says. My sister is receiving pop-up notifications on her Mac and wants to stop them. She ran malware bytes and that it didn't help. So I asked for some screenshots of these things and they look pretty much. I am almost certain that these are notifications from a website. You know, you can, t websites can ask you oh, yep, yep. to let you notify them and uh, to let them notify you rather. And, uh, and usually those would be notifications you'd want to get. But this website uses an icon that looks a whole lot like a system settings icon. And the notifications that come through are your iCloud is being hacked. Click here to remove the virus. Mac OS is infected. Click here to turn on antivirus. Right. Like and, and of that's course, the, that's so rude. Right. Yeah. And when you click that notification, it brings you to the website. The problem is you've granted permission for that notification. So it's not malware it's just like like social engineering conware. it's conware, conware. Yeah. Oh. oh yeah we have a show title dave it's conware <laughs> yes beware you've conware been con. you've been conned there's a great yeah. bitter pill song called conned mm. uh beware uh the conware uh i love it what's the uh so, company that used to do that they they were horrible about that. It was the other one. It was like, and they were pretty good software. It was about mm. cleaning up your Mac and fixing it and Mac, all that. But Mac their Keeper. advertising. Was, Mac Keeper's Mac advertising Keeper. was yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Trash. I, yeah. I've told the story on this show about why yeah. they did that. They're, they were, um, uh, to, to, to really distill it down, overnight, someone posted to like 800,000 forums on the internet. Uh, because I don't know where else it would have been. I don't. I didn't need to add that. Uh, posted to like eight hundred thousand forums, like slamming Mac Keeper. They were doing great uh, up till that point. Uh, it just so happened that was at the the same day that one of their competition launched, Clean My Mac. No one has told me that it was the folks at one that did the other, but I mean, they they the two companies were started together. The person who started Clean My Mac worked uh. for. I believe the person who started Mac Keeper, and then oh, okay. then this happened. So, like, I'm just sharing facts. What with a you. coinky dink! <laughs> Maybe a coincidence. I don't know. And it really like trashed Mac Keeper's reputation, and they they were in a corner, and they were like, "Well, at this point, we can't. Our reputation can't go down." And so they thought we just need to advertise the crap out of this thing any way we can. And so they did all the pop under and like all the things that they swore they would never do because it was terrible. They're like, well, now we can do them because our rep isn't going to get any worse. And, uh, yeah. and so they did. So, um, interesting. yeah, that's, okay. that's that story. However, back to this, okay, back to the conware. <laughs> yes. The, um, to turn off these notifications, go into Safari settings, websites, notifications and look down the list. You'll see probably if, if you're like me, you'll have a long list there of websites. Some of them will be listed as deny and others will be listed as allow. Uh, these are websites where you've already been asked for your decision and, and chosen one way or another. In this case, look at the ones that are listed for allow and you're in good shape. That that I, 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 I guarantee you, you'll find one, you'll find this one there. Yeah, yeah. I I hate allowing notifications. I've got one site and it's Drive Google. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. All I let notify me. Yeah. 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 I yeah, don't yeah. want your notifications. I'll go get the information. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But so. that's the that, that's that's the key is is take a look in there in Safari and I, I'm, what a crappy I, thing to do though to yep. make it look like system information i know uh, pop-ups yep. yeah i wish these people would use their powers for good right right like well, you know they, they consider it good for them if but, you're smart yeah, enough to do that do something that but this is a short-term play right like yeah. why not provide long-term value for people i don't know that's the that's my thing so yelper uh you want to take us to todd I, I can do so at this time. Sure. Uh, Todd's got a question about eSIMs. Here we go. 
So Todd writes in, where'd it go? Uh, I'm getting, where did I? I'll ask the question, you answer it. Yeah. How about we do that? Yeah. Sure. So Todd is traveling somewhere. It almost doesn't matter. And is wonder, it needs it out of the country, out of the U.S. And is going to be using an eSIM uh, for data on his phone. The question is, can an eSIM be used for, can the data from an eSIM be used uh, as a personal hotspot? Uh, can you tether your computer or other devices to it? Or is that not allowed with the eSIM? Right. And so he asked about eSIM DB specifically, E-S-I-M well, Delta Bravo. Um, which and is just a search is, engine for, for eSIMs right, for right? finding, for finding a deal to get, to get yeah. your data. It's the right and way so, to go, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I told him, I said, look, if this is where you wind up, then yes, it took me to Moby matter, uh, which is just one of the deals you can find out there for international, uh, data. And, uh, right there on Moby matter, matter site, let's say that three times fast. Can I use tethering? mobile hotspot tethering on my eSIM. And they say, yes, mobile hotspot is featured and enabled in all of our products, except if explicitly mentioned in the product details. And so that's the thing. Go to go to that one and, and look and search for either hotspot or tethering. And, and it's most certainly going to be there somewhere in the description. And the reason I couldn't find it was on the second page of the PDF because mail prints not in the order yes, sir. that it occurred, but in reverse. So my apologies for stumbling. <laughs> No, it's, it works. Yeah. It's totally fine. Where'd it go? Oh yeah, look on the second what page. Happened? What happened? What happened? Yeah, no, it. I have, I have bought a lot of eSIMs over the last couple of years, and I'm about to buy one probably today because we're going yeah. to Montreal for a few days um, with our niece, and uh, I've I've found that all of them. I mean, with an eSIM, you're just buying data, and and so they don't care how you use it up. When you use it up, what's going to happen? You're going to need to buy more data from them. So they are every one of them that I've used has been more than perfectly happy. happy to let me use it as a hotspot. The only there there had there was one I didn't buy it, but there was one that like in Europe I almost bought. It was going to be like 13 gigs for 10 days, which was perfect for us and way more data than I needed. But the price was right. And, but then as I looked in, it was like, okay, well, five gigs is for like any WhatsApp type and, of data. And then eight gigs yeah. was for like WhatsApp and, and messaging apps. And yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. well, that's weird. Now, I mean, I wouldn't use five gigs traveling for 10 days in Europe anyway. So it, like, it was almost like, oh, this is kind of like interesting. Cause at least that stuff just doesn't count against my five is really the way I was looking at it. But, yeah. but and that only the five gigs was accessible to the hotspot, not the full 13. But, um, I, but I, I, you know, it was like that, that made sense. Cause that one had, you know, it was compartmentalized. So, uh, but right. yeah, otherwise, yeah, they, yeah, every one of them has been like, yeah, I used a uh, hotspot in the car yesterday to prep this. We were moving our son into his new apartment. He's about two hours away on the other side of the state. And so we drove a van over with some stuff for him and then drove the van back. And is he like, living way out west by Vermont? By by Vermont, that's right. <laughs> yeah, as my friends in Texas used to pronounce it, Vermont. You live near Vermont, um, but uh, I was like, man, if I don't prep the show this morning, like while we're driving, I'm going to be up till two in the morning doing it. And I was like, Lisa, do you mind taking the first shift? She's like, no, no problem. So I tethered to my phone, uh, not just using Mint Mobile. I didn't have an eSIM, yeah. you know. And uh, I was on for about an hour and a half prepping the show. And I used just shy of 400 megs and was, I did put it, I will share this. I put, once I connected to my hotspot on my phone, I went on my Mac into Wi-Fi settings and into the detail. Like I went into system settings, Wi-Fi. I chose the details button next to my hotspot that I was already connected to. And at that point, I was able to check the box for low data modes. Low data mode, yep. But when yeah. I I disconnected later and then reconnected, low data mode was turned off again. So I had I I don't know if I have to do it every time, but I certainly had to do it the second time. So bear that okay. in mind. And it did not matter that I already had low data mode on on my phone. Like the Mac doesn't know to inherit that setting. So you have to go yeah. do it on your Mac. I think. I mean, I I I didn't 
I didn't A-B test this, but. Well, you have to do it on your phone too if you don't want to use up your data quickly. Correct. Like for instance, you know, my wife and son are flying to Europe tonight. I'm going to meet them in Europe tomorrow. Yeah. And so because I'm not there to set up an eSIM for them, I went, all right, you know, I'll just suck it up and get the Mint Mobile, which works sure. out to $200 a gigabyte. <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah. Don't do that, so, folks. You know, so yeah. I got them basically, I, I gave them each 20 bucks, 100 megabytes. But I was I was very clear to say, put your phone in the low data mode when yeah. you turn it on in Europe. Because if you don't, your 100 megabytes is going to be gone in a snap. Yep. It's and, probably going to be gone yeah. in a snap anyway, Pete. But uh, Well, there's that. But yeah. yeah, it's just so that mail isn't checking in the background and yes. all that stuff. If, if, you know, whatever's in the foreground is what you're, what's using data. So, yes. Right. Right. Um, yeah. That basically so, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But they wanted to be able to text me and say, yeah, we're here. We're there. We're moving. You know, we've got train tickets. We didn't get train tickets. Whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. so oh, I'm sorry. I hit the table. Uh, but that's was. Uh, yeah. So but you it's can, certainly better to go to eSIM DB and get your data and put an eSIM on your phone than not because it. Yeah, it, it's just so much cheaper. And, and that brings me to one other quick question. Now, I've got the 12, Dave. It looks like I can add a second eSIM, even though I have a physical SIM and an eSIM in my phone. It, it, is it fooling me? Nope. You you are correct. Okay. So I, okay. I've just went through this with my niece who is okay. on Mint. Uh, she had when she moved to Mint, we just did it as an eSIM because it was the, mm -hmm. obviously the easiest thing. So she has a she has nothing in the SIM tray, uh, but has an eSIM for Mint. Mm -hmm. And then I knew we were going to be going to Canada and she's, she's um, going to be in Greece in the fall and obviously going to use an eSIM for that. We could add and, and did a, a second eSIM for her Canada for what, you know, for, for our, our week in Canada here that we've got coming up. But with the 12, you can only have one eSIM active at a time. Okay. Okay. So the 12 and earlier in terms of the ones that support eSIMs and not every iPhone does. I think it's the 10 R and forward. Um, but the, for the phones that support eSIMs that have a physical SIM tray, the 12 and earlier one, if you can have one eSIM and one physical SIM active, that's the only way okay. to have two SIMs active. Okay. The 13 has a SIM tray and an eSIM capability with the 13. You can have two eSIMs active or one eSIM and one, um, uh, 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 what you okay. call it, but, but you can load yeah. one physical SIM, but physical. you can load up many eSIMs. Apple says it's about 10. They're, they're wow. a little less specific than I would like them to be in some of the marketing I've seen about it, but yeah, you can load up e multiple eSIMs, but on your phone, Pete, the 12, you can only have one okay. active. So for that reason, we moved our niece over. We paid the 10 bucks to get a SIM for Mint, even though I had a drawer full of Mint, unused Mint SIMs. They're like, yeah, none of those are going to work. So we paid the 10 bucks. Mint sent us yet another new SIM. And we moved her Mint plan over to the physical SIM in that phone. And that way she can use her, she can use them both at the same time if she needs to and makes life easier. Yeah. Another piece of advice I will give, um, hearing you tell your story, I believe I have buffered myself against finding myself in that position because I know how it goes. I'm the nerd in the house. Uh, and so I'm the one that does all the, these like nerdy little one-off things, right. For people on their devices. Like, ah, oh, you're yeah. not going to need to know how to do this with the whole eSIM thing. I realized they might need to know how to do this. So I have never set up an eSIM for anyone in my family. I'll, I'll buy it and I'll send yeah. it to their phone and then have them install it so that if I find myself in the position you're in, I can say, oh, I'm just going to send you some eSIMs. Turn these on when you get to Europe. You've done it four times before. And, you know, th there's a good chance right. they'll, they'll succeed. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And maybe we can do it when we get there. But uh, Yeah, I was going to say, why not do it when you get there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then one other quick thing, just so you know, if you're on Mint, I'm the family head there in my Mint family. I can't put money on my wife's phone without logging into her phone account. What I was, I Correct. was on with chat support last night Correct. and they're like, all right, if you buy it, we'll transfer it over to her phone, but that's not how it works. And we don't do that generally. Yeah. And yeah. And so I, I, I managed to get onto one account. I created an account for my wife and then I had them transfer them one to my son. And sure. so they both got it, but 
But yeah, they need to have some autonomy. You yes. can't do everything for them. You can't. No, that's right. Yeah, no, it's it's better to uh, better to you know yeah. t- teach someone to fish than it is to give them a fish, right? Like the whole right. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So, exactly. all right. Exactly. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. I want to jump us yeah. to cool stuffs found, Pete. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, I, I, I please, please, please. Go. I, I want to take um, it. I take us where you want to go. Uh, 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 Steve, go. All right, Steve. Steve. Steve wrote in and said. Uh, according to Apple, uh, no, that was me. Uh, <laughs> seems to seems to having a few issues with my Mac lately. Specs attached. I emailed, emailed previously some disk repair issues. The SSD ended up uh, doing a new can pave. Okay, I'm on to the next one. Unsure if this issue is related, but I've noticed over the past few months my slow, Mac slow is down. hot to slow the down. touch. Re, re, yeah, right. re, yeah, slow down at this point. My, yeah, yeah, my Mac is hot to the touch whilst it's sleeping. This only seems to happen when it's plugged into the power supply, uh, and I don't remember this ever being the case on previous Macs. I was convinced the machine wasn't actually sleeping, was some forcing it to, something forcing it to stay awake, but a terminal command found that OS X uh, daily would suggest that it is, in fact, sleeping properly. Uh, I also tried an SMC uh, reset the other day. However, it's hard to tell when it actually was reset or not. Is there any way to tell if an SMC reset worked, or is there anything else you could suggest that's causing it uh, to heat up in its sleep. So, uh, and that's when I wrote. And, and, and Apple don't, don't feel the need to rush through this, Pete. We're we're okay. we're, we're going to give this. Okay. We give everything the time it deserves, and it's fine. Right. Yeah. So I, I wrote back this. I answered the second question first. According to Apple.stackexchange.com, an SMC or PRAM reset will invoke the boot chime uh, to activate it or become louder. Also, try the verbose mode, Command V, and look for the reset message. Okay. And now on to the second question about it being hot. All right. If if Steve's name was Molly, I'd say Molly, this. You in danger, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but his name is not Molly. Uh, I, S- Steve, I, I, I could be wrong, and I hope I am. Um, I, I think there's something wrong, real wrong with your battery. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned that, that your uh, the system, the logic that's, causing the battery to charge or not charge or, or whatever is in there, there's either something physically wrong with the battery or something wrong with the system that, that manages battery charging. And I'm concerned you're looking at a potential fire hazard. Get that thing to Apple or a, a certified Apple repair specialist and get it looked at. Um, it, it should not be getting hot. And when these batteries go hot, they burn down houses and airliners and all kinds of things. So, so please get that looked at. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It shouldn't, like it, it will warm up when it's yeah. charging for sure. But if it's hot to the touch and there's no external reason for, I mean, if you wrap it in a blanket and put it on charge, yeah. it's going to get, then it's going to heat up. It's yeah. going to heat up. Right. But assuming that there is no obvious reason for that to be happening, I, I agree. And at resetting the SMC is absolutely the first thing I would do. And, and I'd reset yeah. the PRAM as well. Uh, assuming it's it's an Intel Mac, and I think he it said is an it was. Intel Mac. Yeah. yeah, he said it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, doing that and then seeing if that behavior continues would would be the first step. But after that, man, yeah, I, I'd like it, it, get it looked at if it's if it's if it's still hot to the touch. That hot to the touch is is that's pretty darn hot. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that that was good. I'm I totally happy to take the time with that one. It's great. I yeah, like taking I just, the time with all of these. I just, we run well, out because, you know, I just, that's one I just went, eh, yeah. th- that's, that's time sensitive. It <laughs> is time sensitive. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. So. Yep. We were talking right. about, um, chi mice. My wife was, was saying, it's weird that Apple doesn't have, that's a, the chi thing I was asking about. Have, have a chi. Yeah. My wife was like, this is stupid that there's Apple doesn't have a, like a, a a mouse that charges on a cheap pad. Why? Like that seems obvious to me. It's like, Oh yeah. Are there any? And in discord, uh, listener, John said, as long as you don't mind the money, you can get the Logitech power play G I believe is what it's called. The Logitech G power play system. Uh, it works with their gaming mice and select others. And the entire mouse pad becomes your charging pad. So thank you for sharing that, John. If anybody else knows, of any chi uh, chargeable mice, uh, that would also be interesting. So I think we would all appreciate hearing about that. It's uh, feedback at macgeekab.com. Whoa, whoa. Feedback at macgeekab.com? That's what I said, Pete. Feedback at macgeekab.com. Yeah. All right. Yep. 
Well, that was my confusion earlier when I was asking about Qi remotes. Ah, it was the Qi mouse. I knew I had mouse. seen something about a Qi charging device. Yeah. The Qi mouse. Well, while we're on the subject of Qi stuff, I had an opportunity to check out the Zen's Liberty, which is a kind of like an air. It's the, like the the uh, the air power pad that never made it to our worlds and Amazon's got it for 169 bucks, at least as of the time that we're recording, it's got 16 coils in it and it's just, it's a, you know, it's a big pad, maybe, I don't know, eight inches by four inches or something. And you just put your stuff down on your phone, your AirPods, whatever. And it charges. They've got a little plug in for an Apple watch that sort of sits up and behind it. If uh, so, you can't just lay your watch on it like Apple promised with AirPower, but uh, of course, AirPower never could exist. So you just hang your watch on this thing and on a, on a little watch puck, and you're good to go. Um, and it, they've what what I like about it, other than the fact that it works, is that you can get it in with a black surface, or you can get it with a clear surface and even see the coils through it, which I kind of yeah. like. I mean, it's nerdy, yeah. right? But I mean, hey. Hi, have we met? I'm Dave. It's I'm like a, a watch with a with the clear face. You can watch the gears going. You watch on the gears. That. Of course, you, if you see things moving in there, or if you see sparks happening, it's to unplug it and walk no. away. But well, I, 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 I have not. Like, but I don't mean to. I don't. I don't want to say something untrue about this product. I, it's been. It's worked fine for me. But uh, mm. if you see things moving in there, that they are not supposed to. Unlike a watch, where you you know you get the the. Ooh, that's the a good idea. Thing. Apple, are you listening? That's a good idea for an Apple Watch face. I think Go somebody gears, made move. one. Well, I know there's one that, you know, like your phone, you can see where yeah, things are in the, you movement, know, the, right. the battery and you know, there's no movement. It'd be cool to have faux gears moving in the Right. I would like that. I don't know how many other people would. Uh, a lot of people would like huh? it. Let's be, let's yeah. be frank about it. But people yeah. would think there would be those folks out there. It would be like, oh no, the Apple watch is mechanical. You can see the thing. Um, <laughs> okay. See? Yeah. Right there. Right through the glass. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right through the glass. You know what? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you, sure. Why not? Yep. You believe me, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of seeing things, PC Unix in our Discord shared this idea of using mo stick on battery powered motion sensor lights inside of a variety of things, uh, like, you know, inside of cabinets mm -hmm. and uh, a bunch of other things. What did he say? He says, I put motion sensing lights in all our kitchen and bathroom cabinets. Everyone who has opened one since then immediately loves having them. I recharge them monthly, whether they need it or not. And there's tons of these available on Amazon. I was looking, uh, you know, I found a six pack for 12 bucks. Like it, there's, there's, there's just tons of them out there. Um, and you just stick them in. I, uh, I some of these will say that, you know, the battery's going to last for three months. They, they use like um, three, three triple A's are the ones that I found. Um, and you can buy, yeah. you can buy rechargeable triple A's. So yeah, that would be kind of the thing is just look at what the, what the battery types are. And of course the form factor, but yeah, I'm thinking about this in, in our kitchen cabinets and, uh, I think it yeah. might, that I insured nice. that one, I think several months back, that was the little light bar that was motion sensitive. Yes. I got it. Yes. Yeah, saw it the, I think it was the Yee light, but yeah, um, exactly. Yep. Uh, at, the cool thing about that one, and I don't see it on this one or not is you, I actually glue double-sided tape whatever it is yeah a little metal piece uh, to the top of the to the bottom of the shelf sure and that way it magnetically sticks on yep. so that's how it's easy to pull off and charge it looks like these might be the same yeah yeah they magnetically hold themselves um up there, so. yeah, yeah it yeah. is so nice to have i think that. that's right like, yeah yeah i think you're right yep so. yep um uh, for i think just looking at the time for the home kit uh, folks here, the Eve weather is a, a great little sensor. You put it outside. It's 70 bucks, put it outside. It gives you your, it's essentially a, a, a Wi-Fi connected weather station for temperature, humidity, barometric pressure. And it use using the historical data that it pulls in, in the Eve app, it could start even doing some sort of predictions and things like that, which is which is pretty cool. It's IPX4 water resistant, completely wireless. I've now got one outside. One nice part about it is in addition to sending all the data to your HomeKit system, it also has a display on it. So you get to see the temperature and humidity while you're outside, mm. which is kind of nice. Yeah. 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 It's um, 
That's pretty Very good. Cool. So yeah, and another argument for HomeKit. It is another argument for HomeKit. Yeah, now I want to figure out: can I t- get the data from that and and like use it in my non HomeKit stuff? I will. We'll right. see. We'll see if I can get there. One last one. Speaking of the non uh, HomeKit stuff, listener John, I believe it might have been Porthos John. I gotta I gotta look in the the notes here. But listener John, I have it listed as John, suggested, yeah, it was, oh no, yeah, it was Porthos John. He says, uh, the brilliant uh, smart home control system with switches and screens is it links with HomeKit, but also talks to things that are not HomeKit. And so you would use these uh, to control your devices. He says it links with Sonos. Um, It's the only in-wall wired switch uh, John says, he says, uh, it's the only one wall wired switch that I found where you can set the switch part to be virtual for hue equipment. For example, I can sw- set the switch to be always on for power and then let the actual slider or switch control the attached bulbs via hue command instead of actually cutting power, which of course takes the hue bulb off of Wi Fi. So I'd never heard of this brilliant system before, but if I might uh, be forgiven, it seems kind of brilliant. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I need to learn more about this. If anybody out there has used it, let us know either feedback at MacGeekab.com or join MacGeekab.com slash discord. Cause I, like, this seems like the right kind of switches to put in where it's already working with, like I said, home kit, Sonos, yeah. uh, the, the a lady, the Google thing, smart things, hue, slage, ring, quick set, eco Residio, Honeywell, Genie, like they've got a bunch of partners here. So yeah. yeah. Do you see a price point on that, Dave? Uh I you know, I was just gonna jump to this. They've got a bundle, uh okay. two switches mm. and a panel starter Ooh. bundle. Yeah, <laughs> Those well, are not free. No, they're not but free. What they do. <laughs> but what they but it's like it's like five hundred and sixty bucks, uh five hundred and thirty bucks for a one switch and a starter panel. You, so you get the one switch panel starter bundle has for $530 has three switches and uh like a panel that's a display um that yeah. you can kind of like it's almost like an iPhone on the wall in a se- I don't mean to say you're yeah. putting your phone on the wall but it's that size of a display it sort of looks like that and then you can um touch yeah. the various things you touch the various throughout the home you yeah. Know, yeah so well, it's- so it's really like it's not you know then you could add more dimmer switches, I presume. Yeah, you can, you can, um, yep. Dimmer, sw- a dimmer switch itself is 70 bucks. A three pack of dimmer switches is 190. A 10 pack is 600 bucks. So, you know, you get one of these, you got to have the controller, um, and then, you know, these things sort of sure. all feed from it. So I think of the controller as a, a hub that lives on the wall and you can actually interact with. So, like, not, not, no, it's certainly not inexpensive, but for what you're getting, it seems like a, a pretty um, nice, pretty cool thing. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of I'm I, I want to learn more about this stuff. Um, while we're here, I I I might as well talk about the next thing because I used it in the car yesterday. Uh, you know, we rented this van from U-Haul. It won't surprise you that this did not have CarPlay. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of cars out there without CarPlay. The van was actually kind of nice, but um, the uh it didn't have carplay but i knew we needed to have like directions and stuff and we wanted to charge our phones because we were going to be there all day and like doing stuff and so i had the iodi velux mini mag safe air vent mount for car uh for the car and it's fantastic i it's a um mag safe connector you know mount that fits on the vent so it's the vent right to magsafe and then it plugs into USB C. so i i or you know power delivery and so i i put a little power delivery thing in the power outlet on the on the van and it was good to go charged well lisa's phone while she was driving and i was computing and then my phone on the way home and uh 45 bucks it just popped right in if your car doesn't have uh well, if you don't have to plug in for CarPlay, which would sort of negate the need for something like this, but if you if you need to see your screen, if you want a MagSafe in the car, 
I, I I loved this thing yesterday. This was it was great. So nice. More cool stuff found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it's probably something that I will travel with um just in case I wind up renting a car without CarPlay, like having this would be you know a, a, right, a right. built in way because when I don't have CarPlay in a rental car, which they all should by by now, but but some of them just don't. When I don't have CarPlay in a rental car, I need to see my phone screen. Like I'm going to use it if I'm in if I'm renting a car, I'm in a city I don't know as well as home, I'm going to be using it for maps and I need to be able to see my screen. This solves all my problems. It lets me see the the phone screen, it lets me charge the phone, like all of that stuff. So, yeah, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. Yep. So, and that's the IOTTI, I O T T I E Velox V E L O X Mini. Of course, there's a link in the show notes cuz that's how we do it here. We try to, you know, we try to help out. That's what I got, Pete. You got anything else? Dave, it sounds like you invited the band this week. I did invite the band. I always invite the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, you, know. you know, it's fine. It's fine. It is You're nice weather. Compressing them, are you? <laughs> What's that? You aren't compressing them this time, are no, you? No, I'm not compressing them this time. Yeah, I had the wrong thing about them before. You're pre-show. right. Pre-show. Oh, yep, no. pre-show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't compression. I was running them through that. I had the the music oh, running through the the isotope voice thing that that does great on voice. It obviously doesn't do great on music. Yeah. It, you know, it could like there is a thing. There's a switch where you can set it for spoken word versus music. It just was set for yeah. spoken word. I think I used it last week when we played that audio comment. It was a mess audio wise. Like the sound quality was a mess, okay. and so I kicked that in quick to to try and and I left it on. So, oh well, it's gone now. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Thanks for sending in all your quick tips and cool stuff found and everything. It's, it's the interaction is like, it's what keeps this show going. We love it. We love it. We love it. Thanks to Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to yeah. you. Um, make sure you follow us on Mastodon. It's gotten fun over there. Uh, I put links in the show notes because there's no way to just say we're like at MacGeekab at MSTDN.social. Like I could say that and it's true, but you don't want to have to remember that. Just go to the show. Let's click on the links. Once you find the link to one of us, there's me, Pete, and, and the show. Once you find the link, we cross link to the others. And so it makes life easy and you can just, you know, you're good to go. But yeah, it's, uh, it's some fun over there. So come hang out yeah, with us. I'm still new. To, I'm still new to Mastodon. Same. I need mean, to get a good client. Do you have a good point? I like Mona, like? the one I talked about Mona. in the show. Mona. I'll yep. put a link in the show. Oh, right, right, right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yes. Uh, please check out our sponsors. Of course, MacGeekUp.com slash sponsors, the ones we mentioned in the show. HelloFresh.com slash MGG16. Notion.com slash MacGeekUp. Collide.com slash MGG. Pete, what else do you have to say? There's got to be something. Don't get caught slash MGG. <laughs> Made on a <laughs>